So we will go ahead and get started. Um, so first of all, I would like to welcome everyone for coming, those of you who are in person and those of you who are joining us in WebEx. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and attending. Um, my name is Ruth Buter. I am the Serials and Systems Librarian at Himmelfarb Library, and I'm going to be moderating the event today. Um, and joining us, we have two very, very experienced uh, faculty members from GW on our panel. We have uh, Dr. Phyllis Ryder and Dr. Linda Whirling. Um, and I'm just going to do a short introduction to each of them, and then we're going to ask a list of questions. Um, so Dr. Ryder is an associate professor of writing and the deputy director of GW's Writing Center. In addition to teaching academic writing over 20 years, she has published articles about service learning, public rhetoric, and undergrad students' uh, dispositions towards library research. Um, Dr. Linda Whirling is our other uh, panelist today. Uh, she is the Associate Dean for Graduate Education in the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And she's also a professor of pharmacology and physiology at uh, George Washington University. Um, Dr. Whirling earned her PhD in pharmacology, specializing in neuropharmacology from Duke University. Uh, she's the director of the GW Institute for Biomedical Sciences, um, which includes the biomedical PhD program. She directs a three course career development series for PhD students that includes scientific writing, biomedical ethics, and career choice and planning. She teaches in the CN, CNS endocrine and multi-skeletal blocks of the medical curriculum. And she has published over 70 scientific articles and numerous abstracts for conference presentations. So thank you for joining us. Um, Okay, so just a quick session overview. Um, we're going to start with some discussion questions about abstracts and different things to include and uh, general uh, tips and things like that. Um, we're going to move on to some examples of some abstracts and um, talk a little bit about uh, we have one example of a not so great abstract and then a revised version of that and then we're going to look at some real published abstracts and um, find out why why they're good abstracts. Uh, then we're going to look at some useful resources, and then at the end we'll take questions from the audience. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question, um, which is why is a good abstract important when submitting an article for a publication? Hello. Um, so my thought about that is that often the abstract is the only thing that gets read. And that's true both in terms of the process through which it gets published um, and also the way they are read. So for conference proceedings, often the abstract is the only thing somebody looks at to decide whether to accept the piece for the conference. Um, and then similarly, when you're submitting your article to a journal for it to be read, the editor looks at the abstract to decide whether to send it out for peer review. They might not read beyond the abstract at that point. So it's really a gatekeeper kind of a function in both of those. And for readers, um, even those of us with stacks of paper copies of journals on our desks might admit that really we skim through and we look at the abstract and that might be the only thing we read in the journal for that um, issue. So it's really in some ways the only way that your paper will be represented. I, I agree completely with that. The only thing I would add is sort of as you're suggesting, it's your hook. If it's a good abstract, they might decide it's worth their time to go ahead and read the rest. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, what qualities go into making a great abstract? I would say the most important qualities are that it's succinct and that it's clear. I sort of think of it as your elevator talk. Uh, elevator talk is your two-minute or three-minute ride with somebody to explain why you should get a job or why your work is important. So an abstract, just as Dr. Ryder said, that's, that's your chance. That's your chance. So you have to be very succinct. You have to have a clear hypothesis, what you're testing, and a clear conclusion. The only other thing I would add, um, because it's your hook, it's tempting to try to make it spiffy. 
Um, but the abstract also has to really demonstrate your trustworthiness. And so if there are negative findings or things that are ambiguous about your study, you have to be upfront about that. And if, it, if there's any sense that you're trying to hide um, any of those less palatable parts of your study, it will work against you. So it's a hook, but it also it's a hook to your credibility and trustworthiness. Okay. So question number three, what should an author include in the abstract? That depends. <laughs> I mean, there are certainly some features that will be common across all of the abstracts, but, and this might be anticipating the next question too, it depends on where you are submitting it and you really need to follow the guidelines for the conference or for the journal that is requesting it. Um, there will be uh, a lot of the main components but the order might be different and the way you split up the, the different parts of your abstract might be different. I think I would just add, I think of an abstract as a mini paper. It's a mini version of your paper. So you, you need to have in general, at least for the kind of abstracts that I would write, the background, the approach, the question, the results and the discussion. So sometimes it's helpful to write the rest of the paper and then sort of as you would say, abstract parts of that and put them into the abstract. Anything else? Is there a prescribed format that should be followed when you're writing an abstract? Well, just to follow up exactly on what my colleague said here, sometimes there is. Sometimes it, it will be very explicit that you must list background methods, results, conclusions, and sometimes it's more preform. So I would say, and I know you're going to make this point, read the instructions and do what they say. So if they tell you to do that and it's a certain number of words per section, do that. Uh, if, if you don't, then I'd say make it, make it your mini paper. Um, and so the strategies for figuring out what the prescribed format would be would be to look at models from the journal and also to look in the um, links from the website of the journal will have guidelines for the author's manuscripts that will spell that out more specifically. And, and even within the same organization like the American Association for Cancer Research, each of their different journals has a different format. So you can't extrapolate one from another even within the same general category. All right, so this question um, I put in here because I think it's probably going to, to help first-time authors quite a bit. Um, if I were a first-time author, I might, you know, look through a journal and, and think, wow, the abstract comes right at the beginning, so I'm going to start writing my article with the abstract. So the question is, is that a good idea? When should you actually start writing the abstract? Oh, yeah, I, I think I, I did say that. I, in my opinion, you should write it at the end. I see that it's tempting since it's the first thing in the paper, but I think to summarize what your paper says, it's, it should be written at the end. Do you agree? In my field, we often write uh, conference abstracts and we're anticipating going, but before we've actually finished the project. And the, the danger of that is that the abstract comes out in the future tense, right? This paper will, this article will explore, and the abstract really has to in the end show that you are talking about something that's already been completed. So if you are tempted to do that, you really have to be careful going back to correct all of those verb tenses and to be specific to what you actually found in the study. And that's a very good point. And certainly in my field, the abstracts were due six months before the presentation. So often you didn't have all the data. So it was sort of a speculative event. For a paper, it's much different. You should have everything. But for a conference, sometimes it does have to be written prospectively. Okay, so this one I'm guessing is going to go back to the read the instructions thing, but um, are word counts really important and what are the repercussions if you are too wordy and go past the word counts? Could I ask you to pull up the screenshot of the New England Journal of Medicine page? Um, 
I think this one. So if you scroll down, you can see this is the opening page of the article and the, the abstract is going to have to fit in that space. And if I were the journal editor and I saw an abstract come in that wasn't going to fit on that page, now you've just created a huge amount of work for me to try to figure out how I'm going to fit the format of my journal. And you're depending on the kindness of the journal editor to say whether they're going to do that work for you. So it really is, I think, a gatekeeper kind of function, whether you stick to the limits or not. I've actually seen uh, public publications, uh, books of abstracts, where it will say truncated at 350 words, because that was the limit and somebody went over just thinking they could squeeze it in. And then the danger is, if that happens to you, your conclusion is gone. So a major portion of your abstract is actually missing. Okay, so I'm sure this question we could probably go on for quite a while, but what are some of the uh, most common abstracts, abstract mistakes that you've seen when you're either reading um, a journal and see a bad abstract or when you're helping students or uh, faculty members who are writing abstracts? What are some common mistakes? So uh, Ruth, if I could ask you to pull up that abstract, the poorly written example. This abstract is actually taken from this book by Angelica Hoffman, and she has part of the part of it is a series of exercises where you see something that's not done very well, and then you correct it. So in this one, I think this is um, a um, an example of a of a common mistake. The author of this doesn't really matter that you read the whole thing, but the author jumps right in with the experimental approach. There's no setup of what he's trying to do, what the, what the problem is. So he starts really with the methods, and the methods don't help us. So we do have a conclusion, but this, I think, is a sort of common mistake to first-time authors is they assume that everybody knows what they're doing. They assume that everybody else is smarter than they are and knows the whole field, and you know, we write about a lot of different things. You can't assume that. So I think assuming too much, um, something that's too dis detailed, too disorganized, the point is not clear. Uh, you have no idea where the author is going with this project, as far as I can see. Yeah, I would add, um, there was an article that came out in Inside Higher Ed this week that was talking about how scientific abstracts are getting worse. Uh, and the analysis, which I'm not sure I quite buy their method, was to look at the number of long words in it and, and to point out that the abstracts are getting harder to see because there's more and more jargon. Um, and while I think there's some point to that critique, of course, we do sometimes have to use very specific words when we're talking and we're writing to an audience of people who are also scientists. Um, but the takeaway I, I have from that is that it's very tempting just to keep using the jargon and to keep using the very um, specific language when you don't need to, and especially in those opening moments where you are laying out what is the purpose of the study and what you're contributing, I think in those places to be as plain as possible and to imagine how you can describe this study to somebody who's outside your very area, clear area of specialization uh, would be helpful for getting it out there and circulating. Some people tend to use acronyms in abstracts. It's not usually you're not really supposed to do that unless it's something really common, like it seems like you know everybody would know what HIV is at this point, but they might not know other acronyms from your particular field. So in many journals, you're not allowed to use those acronyms, but people use them anyway, and I think that's a mistake. So again, <laughs> follow the instructions. Oh, um, when I was I was looking through the journal um, editor's advice about abstracts as we were setting up for this, and one of them read a very clear caution: do not use any references in your abstract. And you might be tempted thinking that you're supposed to document everything, but all of that documentation will happen in the essay itself. Ruth, maybe we could pull up the the corrected one, and again, don't have to read it, but you hear at least the person has has a 
purpose in mind. Uh, you know, he's telling you about these infections and how they're detected in different milk products. So at least here it's corrected and it's quite a lot better and the conclusion remains as it was. You guys are just speeding through this. Okay, so um, <laughs> what about, do you have any general tips for first time authors who are trying to get published and have never written an article or an abstract before? Um, so my advice would be to really consider where you are submitting this for publication and to do your own research and understand the distinctions between the different journals who might publish this kind of research and to make sure you are targeting it to the right one and then to be really careful that you are meeting the formatting expectations for that journal. So you might end up with uh, one type of journal abstract for your first submission and then if that comes back and isn't accepted you would have to rewrite that completely for the next one. Um, but I would say that a, a, a major error that people make is sort of sending it out without really completely understanding that this journal doesn't publish this type of method or isn't focused on this kind of topic. I think that's the absolute most critical piece of advice. I think I would just add, I would get a colleague to read it and not a colleague who you necessarily work with, but maybe somebody who's in a field that's related or your friend down the hall or somebody that can read it and then I think you should listen to what that person says and have a thick skin. <laughs> I think that's a really good piece of advice is if you ask somebody to help you and they try to help you, you need to accept what they say. Okay. All right, so we looked at, at this example and the revised example, Does, was there anything else you wanted to talk about with this or? Not particularly in this one. I do have a couple of examples. Are we going to go to that next or will you have some other plan? Okay, so. Okay, so now we're going to move in to the um, abstract examples. Um, first one is an article from the New England Journal of Medicine and this is this is one that we, we looked at a little bit earlier. Did you have anything else to add? I think the only thing I really want to highlight from this is to show you how clearly and in such plain language the opening background statement is. Financial incentives promote many health behaviors, but effective ways to deliver health incentives remain uncertain. And always this, this opening remark is carving out the, the need for your particular study and explaining what other people have said and what you're going to add to it. And so that's always the move of that opening part. And here, this model, I don't expect you to be able to read the whole thing, but I wanted to, to notice the way um, the abstract is situated on this page, again, to make it clear how if you're violating their formatting or the, the word count or you're not putting things in the right order, you're going to make a lot of extra work for them. Um, but also to note that the, the set of categories here, and this is, I think, Health Environment um, Journal, environmental health is different than the set of categories for the New England Journal of Medicine. So even though it's, a, you know, they're both very following same scientific method, the ways that they're going to report those out are going to look different in the abstract. And this was just to demonstrate that not all articles in the journal are going to have an abstract. So this is a viewpoint piece um, and it's not required that there be an abstract and depending on the type of journal article within the same journal, they will have different requirements for the abstract. Um, so knowing what category of article you're submitting is as important as knowing what journal you're submitting it to. This is an article that was um, submitted for Research Day this year. Jessica is a student in um, my program, the PhD program, and she's a good writer. And 
Jessica labeled things exactly what she's doing, so you don't even have to search for it. And I thought that was a nice touch. She's got the background, the objectives, the methods, and the discussion. So, you know, you may not know what myositis is, but you might be able to figure it out from the name, you know, muscle, a muscle problem. And so she's, she's trying to say that the, we don't know what causes it, but maybe it's viruses. And so that was her hypothesis. And her hypothesis is the last line in the background. We postulate that viruses affect the epigenome in individuals with a susceptible genetic background. So I thought that was quite clear. And then moving down to the results, um, what she, so she ended up identifying a set of genes that were, that might be related to this. And her very, her punchline at the end, we demonstrate that HRK-induced mitochondrial deficiency could contribute to membrane instability and weakness of the muscle. Okay, so, you know, not everybody knows what HRK membrane instability is, but probably the, the people that she's writing this for will. So I thought it was nicely laid out. I'm going to have one other example. Another of my wonderful students. This student actually won the privilege of presenting the oral presentation for m amongst my students, and, uh, so sh this was the winning abstract. Now, she didn't use that format, yet she, I think she also lays it out quite, clear, quite, quite clearly. Um, it's very hard to treat leukemias, but they have this idea of, you know, bumping up the function of particular cells in the body that fight the leukemias, and how are you going to to make those cells a viable treatment. So it's quite a, quite a nice project, but I think you kind of can get the gist just from reading that. And then if we go right down to the end, so she thinks she's found a way that combines cell-based immunotherapy with nanomedicine, a way to target these things to where they need to go. So it was a nice talk. I hope you heard it. <laughs> and if you didn't, I can send her out. She does speaking engagements. Okay, this slide just has some useful resources, um, and I can um, just briefly click on these, and if you want to say something about them. So the first one is uh, an article called How to Write a Good Abstract for a Scientific Paper. And so I'm, I don't know enough about the field to vouch for the Indian Journal of Psychiatry, but I did find that this particular overview for how the abstracts work and the specific advice that they were giving seemed really spot on in terms of the function of the abstract and some of the specifics of what to include or not include in each of the sections of it. So I don't think we need to go through it in depth, but I think it's a really uh, could be a useful resource to come back to. Yeah. And here was uh, coming back to this example and to, sh to use it to show that if you're navigating this website, this is where you can get to the very specifics for all of the different um, sub manuscript submission requirements within um, AACR journals. And um, you, it breaks out into, you know, 10 different journals and for each of those journals, different expectations for what the abstracts will be and all of the other formatting stuff. So, to, so this slide was mainly to demonstrate that you have to do your research uh, and study the journal carefully before you're submitting. And then this, finally one, this final one is a plug for the University Writing Center. We do have consultants who are trained to work with people in um, the medical and public health sciences. And if you look over to the right, that kind of gold button, um, is lays out some of the services that we're uh, prepared to work with. Um, the the top one, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that one, yeah. Um, and also to say that we have hours in Himmelfarb. We have consultants who are working in the School of Public Health, um, and you can see who they are here. And they are their hours vary each semester depending on their schedules, but you can always find them on the Writing Center website and know when they would be here. And I think this is particularly useful in thinking about if you have a study that you are so close to that it's hard to distinguish whether what you are saying is making sense, 
having somebody who is not part of that study and maybe not even part of your specialty, it's useful for them to be peppering you with questions and forcing you to be very clear and precise and concise. So there are our list of references that we used. And does anyone have any questions, either folks on WebEx or in person? As soon as your work is completed, I definitely try to get it written up and sent off because the review process can be lengthy. Uh, reviewers are asked to return papers in, usually they specify time, usually it's a couple of weeks. Sometimes the editor will send you a paper and say, do you think you can get to this in two weeks? And if you say yes, then you get it, and if you say no, you're not off the hook. They'll usually say, well, what if we gave you an extra week? Because uh, Everybody's busy and they don't want to do it, but it can often take some time. And then when it comes back to you, you're going to have to spend the time revising it. Sometimes you'll need additional data. So it's very hard to say exactly what the timeline is going to be because you never know where the holdup is going to be. But the sooner you ship it off, <laughs> the better you have a chance of publishing. Does that answer your question or is there another part of it that I'm missing? No, I would – okay, so, so the question – if, if you've got old data, is it too late to write it up? And I would say, in general, probably not too late, but I would do a careful literature review to see what's been done in the interim, because you want to update your background information, update your references, and make sure that somebody hasn't already published you know, something very similar. And if they have, and you can still salvage yours, just be sure to cite them, because they'll be the ones reviewing the paper. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Dr. Rutter? Is that okay? My pleasure. So the question is, how do you write an abstract when the genre of the article is not this sort of very clear scientific format? Yeah. <clears throat> so what I would do is to go to the journal and to look at a review article and see how they compose their abstract. And I would look at a few pieces and sort of compare and contrast and do my own study in order to understand what the expectations are. Um, it's probably going to follow a similar kind of move that your opening will be to create the need for this review. Why are we doing it? What's important about it? And then working through what your findings are. Um, but my, my fallback is always to go to the publications to see what other people have done and to see how I can match what I am doing to what they have done. Um, I always find that the most comforting because I can trust that somebody else has done it. Yeah. And I think in the kind of paper you're mentioning here, it is a review article, so it's sort of your job to synthesize the state of the art at the time. So just as Dr. Ryder says, you say you give your overall statement um, in this review, we seek to make some conclusions, uh, synthesize the information on contributing factors to schizophrenia. And then you, you, know, you would go through the whatever it is, the genetic risk, the uh, neurochemical data, that kind of thing. In the end, try to, try to draw it all together. And again, just make it your mini paper. That, that would be just a short version of your paper. Anything else, Dr. Ryder? What we teach in our writing course, shall I start and then now I what you do, is we try to give um, different assignments saying you're writing for these different audiences. If Here's a blog. Write a blog. Write a science blog. So that would have to be something that, you know, might be aimed at somebody with, uh, you know, a 10th grade science student. And then we say write something for a journal article. So if it's cancer epigenetics, then you can assume a certain baseline of knowledge. If you're reviving, writing a review article, certainly you want to start out general. Again, again, the whole idea is to hook your audience. But I think there's so many different uh, formats. There's so many different types of articles you might be writing. And as Dr. Ryder pointed out earlier, a conference abstract is very different from a paper abstract. Because for the conference abstract, you may be standing up showing data and there's some interaction with the audience. If it's a paper, that's what you've got. This is, you know, the person doesn't 
have the chance to say to you, what do you mean in, you know, article in number three? So I, I think you have to tailor it. Additional advice? Um, I think, and this is what, what I think the Inside Higher Education article was trying to get at is that what what they were seeing was a trend towards more and more of this, like, we really want to sound profoundly scientific and really smart writing that had gone to the point where it was now hard to read because it had gone overboard. Um, on the other hand, you're writing to an audience that has a certain common background. Uh, I think that if you're writing it to a scientific journal, you have to figure out the line between your specialty and the all the that very um, the information that you know because you have conducted this study and you're so immersed in it, and come out of that immersion to speak to an audience that's a bit broader. Um, so in the in that case, especially in the abstract, figuring out what are the really specialized terms that are unique to this study, and trying to uh, either explain them more or avoid them in the abstract and explain them more in the article itself. I, I would also just add that when you're writing a paper for publication, it's very important what journal you choose to put it in. So if you're trying to reach somebody who's in your exact research area, then you can kind of pitch it at a higher level. If you're trying to get it in a general, very good journal, I course in our field, cell science and nature, it's a very hard it's a very hard place to publish. Yet it has to be understandable from to the anthropologists, but also the molecular biologists. So there, you it really is hard. You kind of have to walk a fine line. I think going back to Dr. Ryder's very excellent advice is looking at that journal and see what's published there and try to pitch it. If that's where you think you should go, try to pitch it at that level. And also carefully, as you said, assess what kinds of articles they would like to see, what kind of submissions they'd like to see. You don't want to waste your time sending it to a place it can't possibly get published. Uh, so the question is, can the abstract be shorter than the absolute word limit? And the answer is yes, it can be shorter. Obviously, it needs to be long enough to cover your topic, but I don't think anybody would complain about having less to read. I don't know if this is the right attribution, but I think Winston Churchill said something like, I don't have time to write it shorter, right? I think it takes a lot more work to, to condense it down. So if, bravo to you if you can make it shorter. <laughs> Good question. So the question is, have either of you had a uh, student who has submitted an abstract that was rejected and got sent back, and how did how did they improve it to get published? I've had students who've gotten papers rejected, generally not on the basis of the abstract, although perhaps some of the criticisms might have been addressed at problems in the abstract. But in general, I haven't seen a paper rejected based on the abstract itself. I think it would have to be a bigger thing. Uh, certainly, the reviewers might suggest revise the abstract to make it more reflective of the actual study. But I haven't seen it rejected on the basis of the abstract. Well, I just want to take this time to thank our, both of our panelists for joining us and thank all of you for being here. And um, we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you.